History can't be rewritten, but it is sure nice to dream. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're discussing the true story of Netflix's Hollywood. So movies, you think they matter? You kidding? I know they do. Taking place not long after World War II, this miniseries paints a portrait of what Hollywood's golden age could have been had the people running the show made a stronger push for diversity and inclusion. Picture's not a hit. How do you know that? Excuse me? Well, you never made the movie, so how do you know it's not a hit? In more ways than one, it takes us to dreamland, giving Tinseltown a happier ending and a new beginning. To say that Hollywood takes some creative liberties would be an understatement. You think you just gotta show up and poof, you're a movie star, huh? Well, that ain't how it works. Pretty face, but no training. <laughs> Kid, you're a dime a dozen. Aspiring actor Jack Costello, ambitious director Raymond Ainsley, black screenwriter Archie Coleman, closeted studio executive Dick Samuels, they're all fictitious, as is A Studios. For everything creators Ryan Murphy and Ian Brennan made up, though, there is some truth beneath the surface. And for them, it ain't enough to watch a fantasy up on the big screen. They want it for themselves, and I provide that for them. In a way, I'm no different than Louis B. Mayer. You know what I mean? One of the show's key real-life figures is Rock Hudson, who was born Harold Scherer Jr. His name was legally changed to Roy Fitzgerald after his stepfather adopted him. Fitzgerald's my stepdad. Scherer's my real dad's name. I came out here to reconnect with him, but it didn't really wash. As seen in Hollywood, Fitzgerald landed talent agent Henry Wilson, who advised him to start going by Rock Hudson, a name he was never thrilled with. I know in the first 30 seconds if somebody's got what it takes to be a star, and you, believe it or not, you got it. Wilson is also credited for inventing Rock Hudson, molding him from an awkward young actor into a Hollywood giant. Speaking of which, 1956's Giant was among the biggest successes of Hudson's career, although he never starred in a movie entitled Meg or Peg. If I live to be 90, I'm never going to be able to figure you out. 1950's Peggy was among Hudson's first films, but that comedy is completely unrelated. While Hudson was indeed a homosexual, he never officially came out like in the show, especially not at a highly publicized event like the Oscars. Are we doing the right thing? Absolutely, we are. While many insiders were aware, Hudson's sexuality didn't become widely known until People magazine published an article following his AIDS diagnosis in 1985. Hudson died of AIDS-related complications shortly after. Wilson was gay as well, and played a major role in shaping the industry's beefcake obsession. He was also infamous for giving couch interviews, to put it mildly. Don't sit there and pretend to be all offended, sissy boy. You're a fruitcake, just like me. Wilson produced one film, 1961's Come September, starring Hudson, but never pitched a cinematic love story between two men. It's gonna be the first homo love story ever made. But not a porno, mind you. This is a genuine love story. Wilson lost Hudson as a client in 1966 and over time lost everything else due to drug addiction, alcoholism, and other demons. According to Ryan Murphy, Wilson died, quote, in absolute poverty, even though Hudson sent him $20,000 as his health declined. Explicit sex might have been taboo in mainstream film, but Hollywood's golden age was quite risque behind the scenes. I could use a good-looking fellow like yourself pumping gas. Why do you need someone good-looking to pump gas? Believe it or not, one bizarre subplot that's grounded in fact is Scotty Bowers turning his time working at a gas station like a bordello. While he never became a screen actor like in this show, Bowers was a discreet sex worker who set up intimate liaisons for a variety of famous and non-famous figures at the service station. Rock Hudson and Vivian Lee were supposedly among the many big names on his clientele list. We just need to feed the kitty a couple times. <laughs> the show also sees Hudson and Lee attend one of George Cukor's parties with other stars like Tallulah Bankhead. Known for directing My Fair Lady and The Philadelphia Story, Cukor was also a homosexual in real life and welcomed closeted men to his Sunday parties. There's my boy. As Hollywood indicates, these pool parties would get pretty wild after sunset. Like her husband, the head of A Studios, Avis Amberg is a fictional character, although she was inspired by Irene Mayer Selznick. Ace Amberg, if you so much as consider it. Hey, hey, I run the studio. 
You run this house! The daughter of MGM co-founder Louis B. Mayer and first wife of producer David O. Selznick, Irene wasn't an actress turned Hollywood mogul like Amberg. However, she did become a successful Broadway producer, most notably bringing audiences a streetcar named Desire starring a then-unknown Marlon Brando. We are moving forward. I will not be bullied. Black actress Camille Washington is another fictional character with real-world parallels. One inspiration for Camille was Lena Horne, an African-American singer-slash-actress who refused to play racial stereotypes. I never bother with people I hate. You can also see a certain resemblance between Washington and Nina Mae McKinney, the first African-American to achieve a long-term Hollywood studio contract. Perhaps the most obvious comparison is Dorothy Dandridge, who became the first African-American to score a Best Actress nomination for her performance in 1954's Carmen Jones. The wind's blowing me in another direction. Ain't no use arguing with the wind. Where Washington wins the gold, though, Dandridge lost to Grace Kelly for The Country Girl. Despite her historic nomination, Dandridge only starred in a few more movies and reportedly died of an embolism at age 42. When I was a little girl, Walking down the street, I was called a lot of things. Movie star wasn't one of them. Black actresses were largely restricted to playing servants and slaves during Hollywood's so-called golden age. Can we do the line a little more funny? Is it a joke? Or just think, what, what would Hattie McDaniel do? Perhaps the most famous example is Hattie McDaniel in Gone with the Wind. If you don't care what folks says about this family, I do. I have told you and told you that she can always tell a lady but the way that she eat in front of folks like a bird. Her performance as Mammy earned McDaniel a Best Supporting Actress Oscar, making her the first African-American Oscar winner. Although the event was held at a, quote, no blacks hotel, David O. Selznick allegedly pulled some strings to gain McDaniel entry. She still had to sit at a segregated section, however. And do you know what happened when I got to the ceremony? The hotel had a no-color policy. They told me I could wait in the lobby. And if I won, somebody would come tell me. McDaniel didn't live to see Whoopi Goldberg become the second African-American to win Best Supporting Actress in 1991 for Ghost, or Halle Berry become the first black Best Actress winner in 2002 for Monsters Ball. It took all these years for Barry to break down this barrier, and to this date, she's still the only person of color to win Best Actress. There was never really a game changer like Meg that instantly opened new doors to all black actors. Could one movie change the way a nation sees itself? Who knows? But one thing's for sure, America's mad for Yay! Rather, it's been a slow burn for performers of color, and if hashtag Oscar so white is any indication, we're still a far cry from this show's version of Hollywood. Thank you to the Academy for making sure that no little girl staring up at that screen will ever again be told that there are limits to what she can achieve. It's been an uphill battle for Asian performers in the U.S. as well. Asian lead, half-Asian director. Who do you think would go see this picture? A oh, good story is a good story, Miss Wong. My word, you're naive. Even with Parasite's Best Picture win in 2020, Miyoshi Umeki remains the only Asian to win the Best Supporting Actress Oscar, and nobody of Asian descent has ever won Best Actress. Maybe things would have been different if Chinese-American actress Anna Mae Wong had been cast as Olan in The Good Earth, as many felt she should have. The land is our life, and it's better to go south or die walking than to give it to you for nothing. MGM decided against giving Wong the lead female role due in part to the Hayes Code, which forbade on-screen miscegenation, which is sexual relationships between races. Olan was thus played by Louise Reiner, a white actress who really did win an Oscar for her performance. And I'll show myself and my son to all of them. In the Netflix series, Wong wins an overdue Oscar for her supporting role in Meg. Not for putting on yellow face and playing an oriental caricature, but for playing a woman. In reality, Wong was never even nominated for an Oscar, and Meg didn't exist. The big winner at the 20th Academy Awards was actually Gentleman's Agreement, which took home Best Supporting Actress, Celeste Holm, Best Director, Elia Kazan, and Best Picture. And the nominees are Elia Kazan, Gentleman's Agreement, George Cukor, A Double Life. Gentleman's Agreement's focus on anti-Semitism made it controversial. That's anti-Semitism. Oh, that's where uh, some people don't like other people just because they're Jews. 
The Academy did recognize one performer of color that night, James Basquette, who at the suggestion of Walt Disney was given an honorary award for his performance as Uncle Remus in Song of the South. Walt Disney, what did he put out last year? Song of the South, a movie where slaves were so happy they didn't even want to leave the plantation. As for the movie Meg, it is inspired by the true story of Millicent Peg Entwistle, who went to Hollywood with high hopes and exited this world in tragedy. Screenplay about Peg and Whistle, girl who jumped off the Hollywood sign because the town wouldn't accept her. <laughs> I know the feeling. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Entwistle's acting dreams failed to materialize, and after appearing in one film, the posthumously released 13 Women, the 24-year-old jumped off the Hollywood land signs H to her demise. She left behind a suicide note reading, quote, I am afraid. I am a coward. I'm sorry for everything. If I had done this a long time ago, it would have saved a lot of pain. P.E. Of course, this story is given a more optimistic ending in Hollywood, in which Meg chooses not to jump. What if she doesn't jump? What if she climbs back down, she takes her boyfriend's hand, I mean, we know she's gone to the brink, but she survived it. So basically, it's a piece of revisionist history within another piece of revisionist history. Only in Hollywood. We have a whole life to live. Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.